Okay, well, let's just uh, go ahead and have a word of prayer. Lord, here we are on the first Sunday and the first day of a new year. And we live in a world that's in turmoil, and yet we know that we can rest in you. You are the Alpha and Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. And nothing surprises you, and nothing is out of your control. And as we begin this new year, I pray, Lord, that we would be faithful with the opportunities that you send our way, that we can, we can place our confidence in you, and just as we walk with you, Lord, we would be reflecting your character. And Lord, this morning I do want to again pray for, for Pastor Duffy and his young family. We just pray that you would be undertaking for them and giving the doctors wisdom and skill, Lord, as they, they figure out what the problem is. We, we do want to pray for Arlen, too, as he recovers from his surgery, and we know that it's difficult for him to be away from his family. And Lord, we do, as usual, want to pray for our military and law enforcement people and we want to play, pray for our nation and our nation's leaders. And Lord, I do pray that, uh, that you would be drawing the hearts and minds of those who, who lead us to yourself. And Lord, this morning as we look into your word, I again ask that you would open the eyes of our understanding and help us to really grasp what you'd like to teach us today. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, we are... Uh, still in Romans and um, boy, it seems like that picture smaller but anyway so again the the book of Romans was written by Paul about 57 AD from Corinth to the church in Rome and even though though many claim that Peter was the founder of the church there's no historical evidence to back such a claim and there was no apostolic connection with the church in Rome at all so no doubt that was one of the reasons that Paul wrote this book now Paul was seeking to establish these new believers in Rome in the faith and the key verses that we've been looking at is um, Romans 3:28. therefore we conclude that a man is justified by faith apart from the deeds of the law and Romans 8 1 and 2 there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ for the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. And also we've been looking at over the weeks at Ironsides what he had to say when he says the epistle to the Romans is undoubtedly the most scientific statement of the divine plan for the redemption of mankind that God has been pleased to give us. And the theme of Romans that we've been seeing is, uh, is redemption. Now last time we had just gotten started in, into chapter 7, and this morning we're going to, to move on through 7 and into the first few verses of chapter 8. But let's review some of what we've, we've covered. We covered last time. In Romans 7, 4 it says, Therefore, my brethren, you also have become dead to the law through the body of Christ. That you may be married to another. We are now married to Christ, to him who was raised from the dead, that we should be, bear fruit to God. Now God's purpose in freeing us from the law is that we might bear fruit or reflect his character to a lost world and as an example of of this I related the story about uh, the Christians in second century Rome this was a time when great plagues swept the city and the doctors all fled for fear of contracting the illness themselves and even though everyone who was able was fleeing the city the Christians stayed and cared for the sick and many of those believers died as a result. But these, these believers reflected the character of God and how, how they treated their unsaved and dying neighbors. And because of their selfless acts, of, the selfless acts of these believers, many in Rome came to view them in a different light. They saw that these Christians, whom they had once looked down on and discussed as people who as a group cared for one another as a family would, and who also had compassion on the sick and dying that surpassed even 
that of the doctors who had proclaimed themselves to be as, as healers, but had fled as, at the first sign of the plague. And these early Christians put their lives in jeopardy by caring for the sick. So without evangelistic crusades, mass media, or outreach program, these believers changed their society. And when Constantine declared Rome to be the Holy Roman Empire, he did it as a political move. He was really just catching up with the times. Rome was already Christianized, but it wasn't done by Constantine. It was done by individual believers living out their faith. The context in which I related his story was John 15, 4 and 5. Abide in me and I in you as a branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit, for without me you can do nothing. And then, of course, the most important section of this is just the very last. Without me you can do nothing. These Roman believers were attached to the vine. They were firmly entrenched in a relationship with Jesus Christ. And because of this, they greatly influenced society around them. They were not just telling people how to be saved. They were demonstrating a Christ-likeness to the world. A, uh, I close that message with uh, the statement that if you want to change the world, abide in Christ. But let's look a little closer at what it means to abide in Christ. By abiding in Christ, we're, we are living as believers who know that they are loved by God. Such believers understand that as a child of God, he or she is totally acceptable in God's sight. He or she understands that they are loved by God with an everlasting love, and the knowledge of that love motivates them above everything else. Understanding how God sees us is what we mean by abiding in Christ. Now, the natural outworking of this understanding is a yielding to the Spirit of God, which results in the fruit of the Spirit. Now, in Galatians 5, and 23, it says, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, gentleness, our faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And this, whether you believe it or not, is the key ingredient to evangelism. Because of, of this understanding, these Roman Christians were able to live above the circumstances that life had placed them in. And living this way, they made an impact not only on their community, but on the whole Roman Empire. Now we're going to see uh, we're going to continue to see Paul make his case as, that as believers, we are not to live under the law, but we are to live as, in sensitivity to the Spirit of God. And he begins by explaining again the value of the law. In Romans 7, 7 through 9, what shall we say then? Is the law sin? Certainly not. On the contrary, I would not have known sin except through the law. For I would not have known covetousness unless the law had said, you shall not covet. But sin, taking opportunity by the commandment, produced in me all manner of evil desire. For apart from the law, sin was dead. I was alive once without the law, but when the commandment came, sin revived and I died. Now the Pharisees, remember, often taught by asking questions, and we see Paul revert to that same style in his writings. So he asks the question, is the law sin? Now we're dead to the law and no longer under it, but that doesn't make the law sinful. The law is the righteous standard of God's holiness. And the law continues to serve a purpose in the lives of men. None of us 
would have understood the power that sin had over us if we had not come face to face with the law. Now this brings us back to the truth which we see within the heart of man, a desire to be independent from the law of God. And the restraint put on man through the law makes man's rebellion against God obvious. Now, I've, and I know I've shared this before, I heard of a test one time given to a bunch of small children. And one of the time these, these, these children were taken into a room that was filled with, with all kinds of toys and everything that would interest a little kid. They were just toddlers, and, and there, there was a, or maybe a little older than that, but, but there was a, a camera recording everything that happened. And after a few minutes, the lady who was watching them would say, now I have to leave for a little while, but you just continue to play until I get back. But just as she left, she said, but whatever you do, don't touch the doorknob. And then she left the room. Well, guess what each of these little kids did? Each one of them would eventually head for that doorknob and they could not resist the fascination to check out what was forbidden now some of the kids would approach it really slowly and carefully and reach out and touch it and then look to see if anybody had seen them some of them would examine that doorknob closely and feel it and try to figure out why they weren't supposed to touch it And others would touch it, then grab it, turn it back and forth, and hang from it. But do you think that the doorknob was more interesting than the toys in the room? Of course not. So what was the fascination with the doorknob? If the lady wouldn't have said anything at all about the doorknob, would the kids have wanted to touch it? I don't think so. But the lady gave them the law. And this demonstrates that even children have a sin nature and the natural inclination of their little hearts is to resist the law. Well, Romans 7, 7 through 9 says, and what shall we say then? Is the law sin? Certainly not. On the contrary, I would not have known sin except through the law. For I would not have known covetousness unless the law had said, you shall not covet. But sin, taking opportunity by the commandment, produced in me all manner of evil desire. For apart from the law, sin was dead. I was alive once without the law, but when the commandment came, sin re revived and I died. So notice, notice what, uh, what Paul said. But sin, taking opportunity by the commandment, produced in me all manner of evil desire. Now in this, in this sin nature, or it, it, it is this sin nature in mankind that makes him chafe so much at any kind of legal restraint. So the law was necessary to bring understanding of our sin. And in Romans 7, 10 through 13, it says, And the commandment which was to bring life, I found to bring death. For sin, taking occasion by the commandment, deceived me, and by it killed me. Therefore the law is holy, and the commandment holy and just and good. Has then that which is good become death to me? Certainly not. But sin, that it might appear sin, was producing death in me through what is good. So that sin, through the commandment, might become exceedingly sinful. Therefore, the law is holy and the commandment holy and just and good. So is the law bad? No, the law is like an x-ray machine. The machine may reveal cancer, but that doesn't make the machine bad. 
The machine only reveals what's already there. The Mosaic Law gives a picture of how we really are. It shows our total depravity. And in Romans 7, 14 through 17, it says, For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, sold under sin. For what I am doing, I do not understand. You ever been frustrated with your sin issues, the problems that face you every day? Well, this is Paul. He's, in, he's saying the same thing. For what I am doing, I do not understand. For what I will to do, that I do not practice. And what I hate, that I do. If then I do what I will not to do, I agree with the law that it is good. But now it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells in me. The issue of the law is now settled. For we know that the law is spiritual. But what about this, this problem within myself? As I mentioned before, there are those who believe that after salvation, the old sin nature totally disappears. But if we only have one nature after salvation, and that's the new nature, what about Paul's declaration here that sin dwells in me? How do we deal with Paul's statement? Well, Scripture teaches clearly that we have two natures within us. And in Ephesians 4, 21 through 24, it says, If indeed you have heard him and have been taught by him, as the truth is in Jesus, that you put off concerning your former conduct, that old man which grows corrupt according to the deceitful lusts, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind, that you put on the new man which was created according to God in true righteousness and holiness. So we have both the old nature and the new within us. Okay, back to Romans 7, 18 through 21. For I know that in me that is in my flesh, nothing good dwells. For to will is present with me, but how to perform what is good I do not find. For the good that I will to do, I do not do, but the evil that I will not to do, that I practice. Now, if I do what I do, will not to do, it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells in me. I find then a law that evil is present with me, the one who wills to do good. Now, our problem is the sin nature is not dead. And unless we allow the Spirit of God to counteract it, it will control our lives. Believers can make a mess of their life. Paul here is picturing the total incapacity of the believer to walk with God in his own strength. Now this is uh, something that all of us as believers have faced, the frustration of our battle with the old nature. Now what a blessing when we come to a place of realization that our victory is not wrestling but resting. The concept, uh, this concept is also mentioned in, in Hebrews 4, 9 through 11. There remains therefore a rest for the people of God, for he who enters his rest has himself ceased from his own works as God did from his. Okay, if you're going to rest, you're going to have to quit working at it. You got to cease from the works. So in other words, there is a rest for the people of God. Provision has been made. We have within us the power to live for God. Now this power is not of ourselves, but of the Holy Spirit through whom we can resist sin and experience victory in the Christian life. But Paul continues to outline this struggle in Romans seven twenty two. It says, for I delight in the law of God according to the inward man. So the inward man would be that new nature which delights in the law of God. You know, when you're walking with the Lord, you just enjoy the things of God. You enjoy fellowship with other believers and you enjoy reading the word and studying it. Those are things you just enjoy. 
It delights in the law of God. And the, the Greek word is trans, translated as delight is not used anywhere else in the New Testament. And it means to rejoice because of understanding. The new nature is sensitive to the Holy Spirit who guides us into all truth. And this new nature is going to naturally be drawn to the word of God where it rejoices in the truth. And in Romans 7, 23 through 24, and it says, But I see another law in my members warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin which is in my members. O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from this body of death? So Paul is giving us a clear picture of the believer who is trying to serve God in his own strength. He's going to make himself live right. He's going to do it on his own. But he says, I see another law in my members warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity. You ever feel just frustrated as you try to walk with God? Is there some area in your life you just really just gets you down? Well, Paul was there too. As we look closely at this, we can't help but notice that the emphasis is on self. Because he's trying to do it on his own. Self-effort will never provide us with a consistent Christian life. A true walk with God only comes through a grace relationship. It only comes when you're really focusing on the Lord Jesus Christ. If you're counting on self-effort, you're going to only be frustrated as a believer. All through this chapter, we see the words, I, me, and my. Look at Romans 7, 23 in an example. But I see another law in my members warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. The focus is on self-effort. We can see the frustration that Paul experienced as he tried to live the Christian life in his own strength. And in Romans 7, 24, he says this, O wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? How many times have we been in the same place? How many times have we just been frustrated with our own attitude. And he says, Paul was there, a wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? Now keep in mind that although what Paul is explaining here is unfortunately the case in the life of, of many believers, and maybe all of us at some time, it's not intended to be a picture of the normal Christian life. Paul is giving us a glimpse of his personal struggle and where he labored for a short time as a new believer. And what he is describing is not necessarily part of the Christian experience. It can be, but it doesn't have to be. He went through this struggle when as an immature believer he placed himself back under the law of Moses. He tried to live the Christian life according to the law, and we as the children of God are no longer there. If you're trying to live your life according to a list of rules, get ready to be frustrated. Romans 6, 14 says this, For sin shall not have dominion over you. Now get that. Sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under the law, but under grace. So this conflict that Paul is describing here is not an example of what, of what we all face. You don't have to face this. This doesn't have to be you. It's actually a warning in regard to what happens to the believer who fails to live as if he is dead to the law. Unfortunately, that's how many believers see their Christian experience. In Romans 7, 25, it says, I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then, with my mind, I myself serve the law of God, but with my flesh, the law of sin. 
Peace comes to us as believers when we see that Christ has accomplished all of this for us. He's, he has really provided for us the way to a victorious Christian life. He says, I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. If you're always focusing on how to overcome a certain sin, you're going to continue to do it. If you forget about that and just focus on a walk with Jesus Christ, just focus on getting close to him every day, you're going to find pretty quick you don't even think about that other thing. So this is a statement of hope. I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. We're not alone. We have one that is strong to save. We're not under the law, but we are under grace. And the grace way is a, a God-honoring path for it is a way of faith. We're not only saved by faith, but we walk by faith. And a walk with God is not accompanied by striving against sin, but by a relationship with the Father. Remember, we enter into his rest by ceasing from working at it. And this moves us right into the next great truth of the book of Romans. Romans 8.1 There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus who do not walk according to the flesh but according to the Spirit. Now the last part of this verse is actually taken. Now you're going to find this in your King James. Or you, but the last part of this verse is actually taken from Romans 8.4 that the righteous requirement of the law is fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. Now, all translations except the King James uh, in Romans 8, 1, end with the word Jesus. And so it should read like this. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Now, this, the reason it ends here is that the, in other translations, is because the Greek text ends here. And this is important, an important thing to remember. There is no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Now, I'm going to get on and explain that a little later, but, so don't, don't panic. Don't think, okay, he's just saying we can do anything we want, because I'm not saying that. Grace never produces condemnation. The law does. Under grace, there's pardon. Grace never says that you have no sin, but grace pardons you for that sin. And this is referring to our standing, our position, who we are in Christ. Now, as believers, we all share in the risen life of Christ. So as a believer, I am never seen by God any other way than in Christ. A believer who understands this truth is just... Is, is like those early believers in Rome that we talked about. They understood that as a child of God, they were totally acceptable in God's sight. They understood that they were loved by God with an everlasting love, and understanding this truth enabled them to live above the circumstances that life placed them in. It, it enabled them to, to go into these homes where people were dying of the plague and care for them, even when they knew that this may take my life too. But that's okay. Because I have a God that's greater than this plague. This understanding is also what motivated them, that motivated them in their Christian experience. Now let's look at Romans 8, 1 through 4. Because this is a... The reason there's no condemnation is explained if you read this in its entirety, Romans 8, 1 through 4. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, for the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh, God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh. On account of sin, he condemned sin in the flesh that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh or according to the law, but according to the Spirit or according to grace. God did something through Christ that the law could never do. The thing that God did was to make it possible 
for me to live a holy life by trusting on, in the indwelling Holy Spirit. The righteous requirements of the law are fulfilled as I abide in Christ, as I just rest in Him. But let's back up a minute. Let's look again at Romans 8.1. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Does this mean that as a believer I can sin and never experience the consequences? Now we've been talking about our standing and our position as a child of God, but we need to understand that and nothing can affect that standing. Just as your children will always be your children, regardless of what they do, we have the same relationship with God. Now, my kids can really mess up. They're all older now. I mean, now my kids are in their 40s. But there's nothing they could do that, wouldn't make, that, that would ever remove them from being my kids. They're my children. And when I become part of God's family, I become his child. And in Romans 8, 16 and 17, it says, The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God, and if children, heirs. Now, heir, an heir is one who inherits. An heir of God and a joint heir with Christ. Now, this is our, our standing, our position in God's family. And this position, or our standing as children and heirs with Christ, never changes. My position can never change. I am a child of God. Now, my standing or position in God's family doesn't change because I'm in Christ, but I can do things that can affect my condition. Not my position, but my condition. My condition can change. My relationship in that family can be strained. Just like with your children. They can do things that can strain a relationship. I can allow my sin nature to control me to the point that I am no longer abiding in Christ. Nor am I reflecting the character of God. And when that happens... The Holy Spirit who indwells me as a believer convicts my heart. But there's still no condemnation. I cannot lose my position in the family no matter what. I'm still God's child. But just as I, am, I might rebuke one of my sons who's involved in, in something that is not good for him, God will at times rebuke me as his child. In Hebrews 12, 5 and 6 in the NIV, and that doesn't stand for North Idaho version, <laughs> or the nearly inspired version. It's the New International Version. That's what it is. It says, My son, do not make light of the Lord's discipline. And do not lose heart when he rebukes you, because the Lord disciplines those he loves and he punishes everyone he accepts as a son. Okay, when I'm a son and I mess up, I don't get off scot-free. He's going to discipline me because I'm a son. If you're not being disciplined, it's because you're not a son. And as believers, whether you're a man or a woman, you're considered... As a child of God, you're one who inherits. So you, you are an heir. You are looked at as a son. God cares enough for me <clears throat> as his child to confront me with sin in my life. Because the Lord disciplines those he loves and he punishes everyone he accepts as a son. Now as an example of this, let's say that after today's service, I go home and I speak in an unkind way to Janet. I mean, not that I would ever do that. I do have some expectations of her. Whatever's in that envelope as the pastor, I should get the tenth of. <laughs> right? There should be a tithe. Now, we have this problem every time her birthday comes around because she never shares. 
Well, let's say I go home and I speak in an unkind way to Janet. Well, Ephesians 4.31 says, Let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. And then Ephesians 5.25 says, Husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her. So I know what the Bible says. I know the way I'm supposed to treat my wife. So if, if I speak to her in an unkind way, or do you think the Holy Spirit is going to let me get away with that? He's our guide. And he, is given, he was given to direct us. So do you think that he's just going to ignore the way I treat my wife? Or do you think he's going to ignore the way I treat anybody if I treat them in an unkind way? No. Because it's impossible for me to be unkind to my wife and in fellowship with God. It doesn't work that way. So the Holy Spirit <clears throat> will start convicting me <clears throat> to change my condition. And in 1 John 1, 9, it says, If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And when we talk about confessing, it's not saying, God, forgive me. Because that's not confession. Confession is agreeing with God that we've done wrong. So I'm agreeing with God. When, we, when I agree with God, yeah, Lord, I know I shouldn't talk to Janet that way. The instant I agree with God in regard to my sin, my relationship with him is restored, my condition is changed, and I'm back in fellowship. But it doesn't end there. Because the Holy Spirit is indwelling me, and so he's going to keep bugging me until I, I ask Janet's forgiveness. And I finally get up and say, okay, you can keep everything in the envelope. <laughs> so even though my position in God's family never changes, my position doesn't change. I am his child. And because I'm his child, he's going to discipline me. Because my condition can change in his family. I can be out of fellowship, not only with the Father, but also with other members of the family. And if I am, he will deal with me. This is what communion's all about. Communion, when we come together and take communion, we're saying, we agree, we are together, we're in unity as a family. And if we are not in unity as a family, then we shouldn't be taking communion. Every time we take communion, we're making a declaration to the world that we are a family of believers that dwell in unity. Because I'll, I'll be honest with you, if we weren't, we wouldn't be having communion. Because I'd be calling the deacons and say, hey, we got some problems. And we can't take care of, we can't have communion until we take care of that. Because communion is a declaration that we are in fellowship with each other and with God. Unfortunately, a lot of believers don't see it that way. And so they, if you read it, what it talks in Corinthians about taking communion. It says the reason some people die or some people sleep is because they take communion in an unworthy manner. In other words, they are angry at each other in the body of believers and they're still going on taking communion. You don't do that. Well, I've got to go watch it. I'm preaching a whole other sermon. You don't want to hear another sermon. But so let me end this morning with this. Conviction by the Holy Spirit is different than guilt. When the Holy Spirit convicts my heart and I respond by confessing my sin, that sin is forgiven and forgotten by God. It says, there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. I don't have to go around grieving over what I did. Because he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If I go around beating myself up after I've confessed my sin, it's the same as saying, well, I'm sorry, God, you might say you've forgiven me, but I haven't. I don't think it's true. Maybe I just haven't forgiven myself. But God says it's taken care of. Let's read again Romans 8, 1 through 4. There is there, 
For now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, for the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh, God did by sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh. On account of sin, he condemned sin in the flesh, that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. So the law only held man accountable for his actions. But the law gives nothing but guilt. Now the Spirit, as a child of God, the Spirit holds you and I accountable for more than our actions. When we're walking with Him, He also holds us accountable for our attitudes. But the Spirit is gracious. And He always points us back to Christ. He always points us back to the forgiveness that the Lord Jesus Christ has provided through his death, burial, and resurrection. I have freedom in Christ and wonderful liberty. And I don't have to go around beating myself up over my past sin. Well, I better quit there. So thank you for listening and